introduce to you Dr. Joseph Haller. Uh, Dr. Haller has doctoral degrees in both behavioral pharmacology and behavioral neurobiology. He is the author of or co-author of over 100 published scientific papers, um, all in the field of behavioral neuroscience. He's on the editorial board for Brain Research Bulletin, Behavioral Pharmacology, and Physiology and Behavior. And since 2004, he's been the head of behavioral neurobiology um, at the Institute of Experimental Medicine in Budapest, Hungary. And so it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you today Dr. Joseph Haller. Good morning, Dr. Haller, or what time is it in Budapest? Well, it's afternoon, but it, I'm glad to be with you. I'm ready to <laughs> discuss with anxi about AnxioFit with you and your audience. All right, excellent. So we're going to talk about a unique intervention for anxiety, worry, and nervousness. And this is a very special uh, compound from Echinacea. And so let's get started. Um, first, so you're at... The, uh, you're in Budapest, Hungary, so we are glad that you were able to join us from so far away. And as I said, good afternoon. There's quite the time difference. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Neurobiology? Well, uh, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences was founded in the last century, in 1825. The headquarters you see, uh, it was built in at the end of the last uh, of the 19th century, uh, but nobody works there. I mean, there are uh, administration offices and so on. I'm actually working in the Institute of Experimental Medicine. You see the picture of this institute on the right hand side of the slide. So there is where where I'm I'm located and where the work was done. All right, and at the Institute of Experimental Medicine. Um, what are some of the major goals? And and uh, and and you, you're in char you're in the neurobiology department. And so, uh, can you explain to us what that means? Well, actually, the whole institute uh, is studying the brain, the function of the neuronal system, and as it regards our laboratory, uh, we are uh, studying behavior the neuronal control of behavior and all the work is related to uh, to mental disorders and models of mental disorders mm -hmm. including anxiety well that is very interesting now speaking of anxiety in the united states we have a saying that when people get anxious they make a mountain out of a molehill and so we know that anxiety suffers well on minor issues and and they become major concerns. Can you talk to us about, since you're an expert in stress and behavior, um, how do you describe anxiety, and what do people experience? Well, actually, uh, anxiety is not as severe or consequential as depression, but it certainly decreases the quality of life. And international surveys show that uh, they inflict considerable strain and suffering. And it's not a molehill. It's actually more like a mountain. Mm -hmm. When we speak about, uh, about anxiety disorders, mm -hmm. sub-threshold or subliminal forms of anxiety are more like a molehill, but they have the tendency to develop into full-blown anxiety disorders, moreover depression. So overall, uh, when we speak about anxiofit and echinacea, uh, then we speak about the molehill that can become a mountain later on. So uh, the, the best way to tackle it is to, to make the molehill disappear. Yes, absolutely. So when we um, talk about, we mention anxiety as if it were just one thing, but uh, anxiety is actually a grouping of, a, of different types of disorders. Yeah. Uh, you see there the names of the major anxiety disorders. The generalized anxiety means that somebody feels anxious most of the time for prolonged periods. This is not uh, prompted by any environmental event or life event. It's just there. Post-traumatic stress disorder develops as a consequence of a life-threatening uh, trauma, which induces horror in the subject, and this is a very uh, long-lasting uh, disorder. Social phobia, panic disorder, obsessive-compulsive disorders are various kinds of anxiety disorders. Uh, when they are subliminal or sub-threshold, 
they pose a small problem when they are anxiety disorders, uh, then uh, they can be rather unpleasant and, as I said, uh, induce, inflict considerable strain and, and suffering. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of conventional interventions. Um, can you talk to us about some of the, the traditional ways that people try to address the problem of anxiety? Well, psych psychotherapy is efficient for some people. It works for some, not really for everybody. And in addition, some people are reluctant to, to disclose their feelings to strangers. So some people may want to go to a therapist, some others may not want to do that. Pharmacotherapy is efficient. There are four main types of, of anxio uh, anxiolytics. All have uh, beneficial effects, but all have also have side effects. Uh, I would recommend these for those who have severe anxiety, so not for mild or subliminal or subthreshold uh, cases, because in that case the side effects are more costly than, than the beneficial uh, effect. Finally, there are the, her the herbal interventions. There are many. And uh, several surveys show that 60 percent of the patients would prefer an herbal therapy over conventional pharmacotherapy, and 30 percent of the medical practitioners may may feel the same, provided that the the herbal intervention was safe and efficient. And this is where some of the, the herbal interventions marketed are uh, uh, where, where the, these fail. I mean, the, 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 the benefits are not, uh, well, there are no real proofs behind the promised benefits, and side effects are not always studied. Now, you're working on, of all things, and this is quite surprising, I bet, to a lot of individuals in our audience, you're working on echinacea or an extract of echinacea for anxiety. Now, we all think, in the United States at least, when we think echinacea, we think immune support. We think boosting the immune system to help fight off a cold or the flu. So how did you become interested in looking at the use of special, unique compounds in certain types of of echinacea that could treat anxiety? Well, actually, I was studying uh, the effects of cannabinoids or the interaction between cannabinoids and anxiety when I started this project. That was one of the major projects of my group. And we had nice, nice results. And accidentally, I uh, got, a, uh, got across a paper showing that alchemites, active principles of echinacea, uh, are affecting the cannabinoid receptors, and this was what we, uh, what seemed to me very interesting, and tried to see whether this effect on the cannabinoid, uh, cannabinoid receptors uh, may be beneficial in terms of anxiety, because I was just studying that. So this is how the whole project started. I didn't look for traditional uses or. I didn't look for plants to see what kind of plants may be used to, to uh, decrease anxiety. I was just simply noticing that the, uh, these, uh, these plants have uh, active principles which act on the, on the receptor I was studying by that time. All right. So if I can uh, summarize that a little bit, because I think we have doctors on the line and pharmacists on the line, but we also have individuals that don't have a biochemical background. So you were studying receptors in the brain which I think of as sort of like light switches. And when those receptors, when they are activated, they promote certain sensations. And so the cannabinoid receptors, when activated, promote a sensation of calm, correct? Yeah, absolutely. They actually decrease anxiety. So they decrease anxiety. So you were not studying plants. You were studying the receptors. And just as it would happen, as many times with many great many great discoveries in science, you happened to read a paper that a researcher was looking at the multitude of compounds in echinacea and had found one that also flipped these switches, yes? 
Yeah, uh, they didn't uh, care about anxiety. They were just studying molecules in the brain and molecules from the plant. So what they discovered was that there are molecules in the in this plant which act on certain types of receptors, which, which were studied by me by that time. Right. So, so you are you correct. Brought, you brought these two fields together and started to ask yourself the question, what if this unique compound were concentrated and could it have applications for human anxiety, yes? Correct. Yeah. So then the, this begs the question, because millions of people use echinacea, uh, why wasn't this discovered earlier? Well, I think there is there are several reasons. First of all, when somebody treats the common cold, then feels better. And if he was an anxious patient, he might not discover that he feels better because also because anxiety was decreased. But mm -hmm. he might think, he or she might think that it, he feels better because the, uh, the flu was gone away. The more important thing is that uh, echinacea plants, plants are not the same. And there are certain constituents in the plant which should be in appropriate conditions. And actually, only a minor part of echinacea extracts uh, decrease anxiety. Most of the extracts on the on the market have no no effect on anxiety at all. And the third thing is the dosage. The dosage. Uh, actually, smaller amounts of the extracts are required to have an effect on anxiety. And as with uh, all the other anxiolytics, large doses become ineffective. So because uh, people take echinacea in large doses, at those doses, uh, even the, the, the best extracts for anxiety are not working. And so this special unique compound that turns on those calming light switches in the brain is found, not, it's not always found in a, enough levels in echinacea to actually have an impact. And so it needs to be singled out, singled away from some of the other compounds in an echinacea and concentrated to have a consistent benefit. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Uh, partly, yes. Uh, the active constituents are a group of compounds called alchemides. And alchemides have a common uh, structure, but there are a variety of alchemides in, the, in echinacea. And these have to be an appropriate concentration, and some of these alchemides should be there, some alchemides shouldn't be there. We call the fingerprint of alchemides. The fingerprint of alchemides should be uh, of a certain kind to have effects on anxiety. And we tested so far uh, 11 echinacea extracts and had anxiolytic effects with four but only one of these uh, had uh, an effect strong enough to be tested in humans. Oh, okay, excellent, excellent. Well, that sort of solves some of the mystery. Um, now, you've done a lot of work, and here's some, um, some graphics that talk about uh, some of the work that you have done to determine the, the family of alchemides uh, from echinacea, their effect on anxiety. Could you explain this to us? Well, actually, we, we tested echinacea first in animals, and we uh, tested them in four tests of anxiety. These are used in the drug developmental process, so new anxiolytics are tested with the same uh, anxiety test. What you see on the screen is the elevated plasma. It's a very simple apparatus, one of those four tests we, we used. And this has two closed arms where the, the animal is feeling safe because this animal is living in burrows. Uh, and two open arms where he feels unsafe. A usual animal uh, gets out to the open arms just for curiosity. And you see uh, on the bottom of the slide uh, the trace of, his mo uh, of a control uh, animal. The red lines uh, show the trace where that animal moved. Uh, this control animal goes out a bit, then he goes back to the safe uh, closed uh, arms. On the right-hand side, you see much more uh, red lines in the open arms because due to 
do due to the effect of echinacea, animals get courage actually, anxiety decreases, and the, uh, and then their curiosity prevails, and they go out to the open arms more frequently. As I said, this is uh, let's say so the golden standard of anxiety testing, and all the anxiolytics used in pharmacotherapy are uh, were were tested in this and the other tests. Mm -hmm. So you also, you did um, also in some of these studies looked at, um, I know you looked at, is it chlorodiase epoxide um, that is in the United States often sold as Librium, which is in the Valium family of anxiolytic drugs? Yeah, uh, we tried uh, benzodiazepine, which is called chlorodiase epoxide. This was the reference compound. And to our great surprise, uh, echinacea worked similarly well, and in a dose range which was similar to chlordiaz epoxide. Originally, we didn't think of having a strong anxiolytic with a plant. And the original aim was to put together several herbal extracts. Maybe uh, those together may have uh, an anxiolytic effect which, which would be useful for four people. But these tests showed us that uh, this plant alone can have effect as strong as a benzodiazepine. Actually, Xanax, Xanax is, is, uh, contains a, another benzodiazepine. And the best thing was that locomotion, which, are, which is shown in triangles, uh, locomotion was not changed by the, the echinacea ex extract, while chlordiaz epoxide, this is well known and it, as usual, it decreased lo locomotion at higher doses. But it was still anxiolytic, it still decreased anxiety, but at the same time uh, had a sedative e effect, it, it depressed locomotion. Well, I used to work in hospitals and I could remember uh, patients that were using, as I said, in America, chlordiaz epoxide is sold as Librium um, for specific psychiatric disorders and it was, it, it, people made them very, very sleepy. So this is quite an advantage to have the anxiety relieving power in an herbal extract of a family of compounds, but not that terrible sedating effect or the, the, the sleepiness, the grogginess. Yeah, this is a problem with, with Sanax and with other benzodiazepine. Uh, even driving a car may be difficult uh, after treatment, but I'm not speaking against uh, pharmacotherapy because uh, pharmacotherapy is efficient. And if somebody has an anxiety disorder, that somebody should take, uh, should uh, should uh, consult a physician and then do what the physician says. But in milder cases, Echinacea might be a real solution. No drowsiness, no sedation, and it seems that it, uh, it decreases anxiety pretty strongly, as strong as this particular type of benzodiazepine. So when you got these results, then you moved into human clinical trials, correct? Yeah, that's what happened. And this is the, the, the actually the second human study. We, we ran uh, three. And in this uh, study, we had healthy people without an anxiety disorder, but who still had uh, an anxiety problem. And this can be seen on the first white column. The, the, uh, the horizontal line shows the anxiety score in the Spielberger state and trait, uh, state and trait anxiety inventory, which is the limit of normal anxiety. And as you see, our subject at the beginning of the uh, test had higher anxiety than normal. And just after one day, there was a decrease in uh, anxiety. And after three days and seven days, uh, the uh, anxiety levels decreased even further. And then we stopped treatment. And at least, uh, and uh, the effect was there for at least two more weeks. So it was durable. After just one week, anxiety decreased, and then uh, we had uh, an effect that, that lasted, as I said, uh, two more weeks at least. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit more. Um, so as you continue to investigate this family of compounds, um, let's talk a little bit more about the specific way in which it works. Well, the, on the upper right-hand side, you see uh, 
the chemical structure of the endocannabinoid anandamide, and below it, uh, two alkamides from echinacea. Mm -hmm. And as you can notice, there is a high degree of similarity uh, between the chemical structures of these, these three molecules. Uh, this was what I've seen in the publication I mentioned when I, when I learned that the echinacea contains something that can act on the CB1 receptors. And below this uh, graph, you see another taken from a publication, the publication I read, which showed that uh, echinacea alchemides bind to the CB2 receptor. Those are the affini uh, those columns show the affinity. The lower the column, the, the larger the affinity of the molecule to the to the CB2 and the CB1 receptor. And as you can see, alchemides bind to both the CB2 receptor and the CB1 receptor. The CB2 receptor is involved in Im immune responses, and the CB2 receptor is located in the periphery, in the body. And the CB1 receptor is involved in mental processes and, and it's located in the brain. And in addition to binding to these receptors, uh, alkamides also have physiological effects on, on uh, endocannabinoid signaling. Mm -hmm. So this is what, what attracted my attention uh, to, to this plant. And uh, uh, the, the alkamides have other effects. For instance, they inhibit the degradation of endocannabin uh, endocannabinoids, which means that the level of anandamide will increase in the brain, which is beneficial for anxiety. And it has strong effects on a, on a receptor, which, is, uh, which has a long name I abbreviated to TRPV1 receptor, which was shown lately to have to be also involved in, in uh, the control of anxiety. And in addition to these molecular effects, we also studied uh, neurons, especially in the hippocampus, which is a brain region that has a large effect on anxiety. And electrophysiological properties of these neurons in the hippocampus uh, are changed by echinacea alchemides in such a way that uh, is indicative of an anxiolytic effect. Um, and I'm going to pause for just a moment because I know that there's probably a question amongst many of our attendees today. When they hear the word cannabinoid, they think of the word ca cannabis, and cannabis is the botanical name for marijuana, which is an illegal drug in the United States, but it also has very calming effects. So these compounds are not, they are not going to produce the types of physiological responses that one would, using marijuana would, number one, and number two is these are not illegal compounds and they are not going to have any difficulties with drug testing, correct? <laughs> Absolutely. First of all, uh, marijuana and cannabis exploits a brain mechanism which works in our brains all the time, right now when I'm speaking. Uh, these uh, mediate communication between neurons. What marijuana does is that it overwhelms this endocannabinoid signaling in the brain which is there without marijuana, and overwhelming it changes the state of mind. Uh, the uh, cannabinoids present in marijuana are very strong. The ones present in echinacea are much milder. And they have no uh, drug-like effects. We tested that. That was a major concern for us as well. So we, we tested that whether it's addictive or whether it uh, induces states that are comparable with, with uh, the effects of drugs, and they are not. And there are no legal problems with consuming echinacea. Actually, this is among the f uh, three mostly consumed uh, herbal uh, medicines. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I'm glad that you could clarify that for us. Now, again, you said that you tested a lot of echinacea, but not all. Echinacea, types of echinacea, had 
the correct concentration and family of compounds that you were trying to seek to have a beneficial effect? Yeah, actually, we tested many echinacea ex extracts, and there are several things that matter. First of all, echinacea angustifolia stands out as a species. The second, the roots of echinacea angustifolia stands out as the part of the plant that is that contains the active principle. And the third, not all the echinacea angustifolia uh, root e extracts have the appropriate uh, alkamide fingerprint for an anxiolytic effect. Well, I think we so have what, a graphic of that coming up, uh, that the what very different fingerprints each of these echinacea extracts exhibited. Yeah, actually, these are five of the extracts which were tested. This was published uh, three years ago. And each spike or each, uh, well, actually, each triangle represents one alkamide, and the height of the, the spike shows the amount. Mm -hmm. And extract number four had uh, a strong anxiolytic effect. Extract number one and five had much milder uh, anxiolytic effects, and extract number two and three had no anxiolytic effects whatsoever. So first of all, the amount of uh, alkamide uh, matters, because extract number two and extract number three had low amounts of uh, alkamides. The second important thing is that the fingerprint of alkamides matter also because extract number five has much more alkamides than extract number four. Still, its anxiolytic effects were uh, weak, while extract number four had much stronger anxiolytic effects, and the same applies for extract number one. Excellent. So then after, um, after you determined which echinacea, you started to do a comparison, yes, um, with, to determine a dosage. So this, tell us a little bit about what this graphically represents with regards to dose. Well, actually, on the left-hand side, you see one of the alkamides present in, in echinacea angustifolia root extract we are using. And this particular alkamide has anxiolytic effects. These are more modest than the anxiolytic effect of the whole plant, which you see on the right-hand side. Uh, but the anxiolytic effect is not produced by one single alkamide, but by, by uh, the totality of the alkamides and the appropriate uh, fingerprint. Uh, as it regards dosage, it's often very difficult to calculate human dosage uh, based on animal uh, findings. But in the end, uh, we used uh, ways of, of uh, uh, evaluating which are commonly used in the clinic. And it seems that the dosage is important in two respects. First of all, one has to take enough to have an anxiolytic effect. But increasing the dosage over a certain limit will not increase the anxiolytic effect. On the contrary, it will decrease it. So one has to be uh, in the right interval, mm -hmm. to, uh, not too less, not too many, not too much. And, and so you determine the alchemide, you determine the dose, and then you moved into uh, creating a natural medicine. And I know that you, had, when we spoke offline, you had mentioned that the cultivation of the echinacea is very important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at start, we didn't care about cultivation. We wanted to see effects. But we uh, were fortunate enough to have uh, to, to find a provider which produced the appropriate echinacea, and he worked uh, according to high standards. No gene modified uh, plants. The plants are grown in rural areas, and so on, as, as uh, written on the on the screen. And I would like to add to, the, uh, to this that this company, which is uh, located in Europe, not in Hungary, uh, always sends off uh, us the, the quality control sheets, but we, we make tests in addition. We right. don't so want to have pe test results. Absolutely. Yes. We don't want to have pesticides, herbicides, and, and other things like that. 
you know. And then you, and then now after cultivation, then you move into your extraction methodology. Yeah. So this uh, extract is an alcoholic extract, no hexane. Uh, and we always check the alkamide fingerprint, mm -hmm. and we always check for heavy metal, heavy metals, pesticides, and microorganisms. And no product goes out from uh, our factory without all these checkings made for every single batch. And each batch is uh, has these quality control sheets attached. And our own measurements were, are quite frequently uh, cross-checked by other labs. There is a German lab where we quite often send uh, samples to, to be sure that nothing happens with this uh, herbal so, extracts. Uh, one of the questions that have been popping up rather frequently in our Q&A box has to do with names of products and where it can be purchased. Uh, folks, we are tr we try to keep um, our educational webinars focused mo on the science, and uh, we don't want them to be infomercials for specific products. I will say that this is available in the United States, and if you are interested, we'll be glad to provide you with um, location information and product names, etc., offline. Uh, so let's go on and summarize um, how to use this unique echinacea extract to relieve anxiety. Well, dosage is indeed critical. Uh, for milder problems, 20 milligrams in the morning, 20 milligrams in the evening mm -hmm. is sufficient. If the problem is stronger, then one can double the amount. So it would be but 40 going more. high, uh, 40 milligrams in the morning, 40 milligrams in the evening. Uh, increasing the dose further has no uh, it, it has no meaning. Actually, none of the uh, anxiolytics work in all the people. Exam uh, for example, Sanax or Prozac or whatsoever, uh, they decrease anxiety symptoms in about 60-70% of patients not more, and this is true for our echinacea as well. So if somebody doesn't feel anything with the highest dose, then this this therapy is not for him or her. So, uh, how soon should someone feel a difference? Let's say they start out with 20 milligrams twice daily. If they're going to respond at that dosage level, how soon will they know that it's working for them? When will they if that? one doesn't feel anything within a week, then as I said, this they is not for him dosage. or her. Well, they might increase the dosage for yeah, another week. One can, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One can try a higher dose. And but then uh, two weeks, no? So two weeks at maximum. One okay. week with the lower dose, one week with the higher dose. Uh -huh. uh, we are at about 70%. So seven out of ten patients have a nice anxiolytic effect. Now, uh, nobody has to worry about uh, adverse effects because even if they consume, let's say, a gram mm -hmm. uh, of the extract, no adverse effects uh, would the one feel. So that'd be and like 50, it, tablet, 50 tablets at one time. Not that we're yeah. ever recommending you do it, but I mean, that's how safe it is, is that you could take 50 of these at one time and you wouldn't have significant adverse effects. Yeah, and it's not only free of interactions with prescription anxiolytics, but it has no uh, interaction with any drug, any any medicine. Actually, this was very thoroughly tested because, as I said, echinacea is uh, very popular. Many people consume it for common cold, for uh, promoting immunity, and so on and so forth. And for this reason, uh, drug interactions were of concern. And actually, garlic is, has much more drug interactions than, than in, uh, echinacea. So it's, it's safe from this uh, point of view as well. That's excellent to know. Um, one other quick question before we move into Q&A um, is, uh, does it matter if you take it with meals or away from food? 
uh, it doesn't really matter whether one takes it with food before or after. What matters is to distribute the dosage, uh, the, 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 well, one should take in the morning and in the evening. And the evening dose might be higher than the morning dose. Mm -hmm. all, right. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Dr. Haller. This has been incredibly informative, and what a very unique natural medicine for uh, a very common problem. Um, we already have an, a lot of questions in the Q&A box, so I want to get started. The first is, is this extract appropriate for children? Can children use this product? Uh, safety was checked for children about one, one year. Uh -huh. So this extract and echinacea in general is safe. We did not check anxiolytic effects in children. We checked them in people aged between 18 and 63, if I remember well. Uh, I would say that children were just as adults in this respect, as it regards anxiety and this treatment. Uh, it's safe, but we didn't check anxiety in children. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, th does this extract work fast enough for acute anxiety? For example, if someone is generally not anxious, but they get uh, very, very upset if they have to get on an airplane, would this be, could this be used episodically, like in that manner? I think that that's the, the, the most efficient way of using it, mm -hmm. using it episodically. Mm -hmm. If one takes anxiolytics, uh, then uh, the treatment lasts a year or maybe two. And one should take that anxiolytic for prolonged times regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, because this uh, extract is acting very fast, within a couple of days, one can uh, choose when he or she wants to take it. With many anxiolytics, uh, the effect occurs pretty late after weeks, except for Sanax, that's, that's pretty fast, but mm -hmm. SSRIs and, and many other anxiolytics uh, have the, their effects uh, after a couple of weeks. So this is fast, no side effects, and can be taken episodically. So, um, in, in essence, you could use it either way. You could use it on a daily basis if you have issues with anxiety every single day, or you could use it if you have uh, a big test coming up or uh, yeah, you have to yeah. get on an airplane or something that makes you anxious. Excellent. Yeah, um, or going to the dentist or whatsoever. Right. Um, here's a couple of technical questions. One is, are the alkamides similar to anandamide? And I believe you did cover that when you were looking at the the chemical structure of these echinacea alkamides, correct? They are yeah, yeah. somewhat similar to they, they are pretty much similar. Yeah. Uh, and this, they also want to know, did you compare it to with the effect with GABA? Well, GABA is a neurotransmitter, uh, and it has receptors. These are called GABA receptors, and benzodiazepines the chlordias epoxides we tried uh, actually acts on GABA receptors. Uh -huh. So, more simply, uh, saying it more simply, yes. Okay. So, did you find that the alkamides in this unique echinacea also have any impact on GABA in the brain, or is it all in the uh, cannabinoid receptor region? Okay. Uh, maybe I mis misunderstood the question. Okay. Uh, the role of endocannabinoids is to control, uh, among, among others, GABA neurotransmission. Uh, endocannabinoids are retro retrograde uh, sign uh, neurotransmitters. I don't want to enter in too many technical details, but yes, <laughs> uh, it, it controls GABA neurotransmission, but in an indirect way. It doesn't act directly on GABA receptors. It controls the release of GABA into the synaptic uh, space, uh, and thus it, uh, it, it controls indirectly GABA neurotransmission. Um, and also, uh, uh, this is here. This is an easier question. Uh, can you use the product for long periods of time? Any problem with taking it for long periods of time? Uh, 
No, I don't think so. No, many people use it for long, uh, long periods of time and no, no problems whatsoever. We didn't see, actually when we ran uh, one of these uh, clinical studies, the third one, then we had a placebo uh, for comparison and the side effects were stronger with placebo than with, with echinacea. Not much stronger, but there was a difference between placebo and echinacea and it was in favor of echinacea. Okay. So you did, that was another one of our questions, how did you control for the placebo effect? You did, in, in one of the studies, compare the echinacea to the placebo, and it was stronger than the placebo effect. Yeah, and in uh, another study, the second one, uh, we have seen it on the screen, we compared two different doses, a low dose and a high dose. The low dose was 10 milligrams in the morning and 10 milligrams in the evening. So this is another way of controlling for for placebo effect, if you give a lower amount than the one which is required, then you in, in fact you have a kind of a placebo effect. And the higher dose, 20 plus 20 milligrams, uh, had significantly larger effects than the, the lower dose. This is called the dose dependence of the effect, which is just as important as the, the placebo effect. So, we, okay. Excellent. Um, can this be, I think you may have covered this already, but I'll ask it since it popped up again. Can this be used in conjunction if somebody is on prescription anxiolytics, let's say someone's currently on Xanax, but they don't feel that it's quite relieving their anxiety in the manner in which they desire, can they add this product on? Is there a problem with that? We did not run a special study on this, but we have consumers already and some of them are in contact with us. And there was somebody who was on Xanax for two years and Xanax worked, but uh, this sedative effect was rather disturbing. And actually what uh, the, the woman uh, did was that he replaced Xanax with our product, I mean Echinacea, and he could get rid of Xanax and could maintain uh, the, uh, the, the anxiolytic effect with, with uh, echinacea. Uh, this, uh, uh, and I think we had two other cases of this type. Uh, after we had this experience with this woman, we uh, advised other people maybe they, would, uh, they should take echinacea to replace uh, Xanax and then the anxiolytic effect is maintained and uh, the sedative effects, the side effects are gone. So the best advice is to work with your doctor, tell them that you would like to transition off because you should never stop any anti-anxiety medication without your doctor being part of that loop because there can be some rebound effects. So work with your doctor to see if you can go on a trial of this, of these, this unique family of compounds from echinacea uh, and to see if your anxiety be, can be controlled with that, correct? Uh, yeah, and I would like to add something. Uh, any medical treatment has an end. And after one year or two years, uh, one has to stop to take anxiolytics. And there is a critical period after stopping the treatment, and many people uh, fall back and become anxious again. And maybe, but I, I emphasize that we don't have uh, targeted studies on this, but it can happen that one uh, can go over this critical period more easily if he, takes, he or she takes uh, echinacea. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question here about, uh, you've heard of St. John's wort and lavender essential oil. Um, people sometimes use those for calming effects as well. Is there, uh, could you use this echinacea extract with St. John's wort or lavender essential oil? Is there any reason you couldn't use it with other herbs? Well, actually, uh, hypericum, what, what was the name in English? Sorry. St. John's wort. So, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it's difficult for me You're to right. pronounce it's hyper these words. Hypericum. Yeah. hypericum. Hypericum. Okay, that's an antidepressant. Actually, it contains serotonin uh, reuptake blockers, naturally produced serotonin reuptake blockers, and it's a pretty efficient uh, antidepressant, and it also decreases anxiety symptoms associated with depression. It 
does not ha really have anxiolytic effects when an anxiety is uh, alone or it's not associated with depression. I don't think that the two treatments uh, uh, would interfere with, with each other, but I think that those who uh, take hypericum, hypericum for depression don't really need uh, echinacea for anxiety because anxiety associated with depression uh, is uh, treated uh, with hypericum per se. As it regards other herbal treatments, I, uh, there shouldn't be any interactions between these. So if one wants to take uh, two things at, at, at the same time, why not? So they won't uh, interfere with each other. Mm -hmm. Here's a very um, important question. Uh, we have often been counseled to not use echinacea in the presence of autoimmune diseases like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, any of these autoimmune conditions, because you do not want to stimulate the immune system, there is the theoretical concern that it could worsen the autoimmune disease or cause a flare-up. Since this unique um, set of compounds and since the dose is so low, do you have to have those concerns with this anti-anxiety product? Uh, we did not study this, and I would say that yes. Uh, those who are treated for cancer or AIDS shouldn't take this for relieving anxiety. I don't know whether it would do wrong or not, but just for safety, one should keep away from, from using this in, in, in when one has these autoimmune diseases or cancer or AIDS. Mm -hmm. All right. So the, the answer would be to work with your practitioner, work with your health care practitioner in, if you're suffering from a disease that may be adversely affected, even though we doubt seriously that this would cause any kind of immune stimulation, as you would see in the much larger doses of echinacea used for cold and flu, correct? Absolutely. Yes, excellent. Um, all right, I'm just going through to make sure I didn't miss any. Oh, here's a person, um, a, um, a friend from Canada, uh, who uh, runs an organic greenhouse, and they do a lot of work with herbs, and they want to know if you have tested. Uh, there's three herbs that they, or two herbs that they believe also may contain these alchemides, and one is called Spilanthes acmella, and the second is called Xanthoxylum bungianum. Either of those no. ring a bell, or have you looked at those? No, no. Okay. Uh, well, people who are not involved in this kind of work cannot imagine how much work should be invested to test just one, you know. So we, we, we are unable to test all the herbs which might or might not contain alchemites. Uh, maybe in the future, once this, this treatment is established and we can focus on other things, we might we might try other herbs containing alchemides, but we didn't do uh, do that so far. All right, excellent, excellent. And I believe this may be our last question. I finally got to the end of a very long list. Um, can you use this in dogs that have anxiety issues? Yeah, yeah. Actually, we we ran a, a very small study. It's not published, but I have a colleague who is studying uh, dogs. These are family dogs, so they are uh, interested in their behavior and uh, ability to think, I mean, cognitive abilities of, of dogs and the cooperation between humans and dogs and so on and so forth. And they often have problems with uh, some of the doc, dogs uh, while, while they are testing them. And uh, actually, I told them to try echinacea, and it seems that it worked. But as I said, the study was, actually, it wasn't a study. There were several trials, and it seems that it works. And it decreased not only, uh, let's say so, fearfulness or anxiety, but it decreased also uh, nervousness and barking and aggression and so on and so forth. So, so it was good to the dogs. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, great. Uh, well, it looks like, oh, um, uh, here's a person who's talking about some of the products they're using to calm horses. I don't know if you've ever worked with horses. No. <laughs> no. But, you know, one would probably uh, 
depending on the physiology, perhaps if they wanted to give it a trial, would dose adjust for the size of the horse, correct? Yeah, yeah. They are about five times heavier than we are or more. Yeah. Well, maybe four times heavier than me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Dr. Holler, I think we got through all of our questions. I was just doing another quick scan. I thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day and calling us all the way from Hungary. I know that you had some difficulties uh, with the, the audio connection, and I surely appreciate you sticking with us and and uh, giving you know and making sure that we were able to uh, connect because I found this information absolutely fascinating, and I I think our attendees did too, considering the number of questions. So thank you. Thank you very much for guiding me through this presentation and for interpreting the, the questions and for being a host. Oh, thank you, thank you. Folks, our upcoming webinars on November 12th, we're going to have Dr. Jacqueline Chassie, a naturopathic physician who has a specialty in uh, children and uh, women's health. She's going to be talking about naturally healthy kids. Uh, next, on December 12th, Dr. Ajay Goal from Baylor University Cancer Research Center is going to talk about curcumin for depression and other chronic diseases and some of the newest research on curcumin and curcuminoids for a wide variety of human ailments. And please note that you can register at terrytalksnutrition.com backslash webinars. Um, additionally, if you have since you have registered for this, you will be sent information on these upcoming webinars if they are of interest to you. Uh, for more information, please feel free to visit us at Terry Talks Nutrition. Uh, you can sign up there for a free weekly newsletter. I want you to know that we treat emails with great respect. We never sell or trade them to other companies. Uh, the weekly newsletter is chock full of interesting natural medicine information. Um, on this site, you can also listen to recordings of past seminars. So if you wanted to listen, for example, to this webinar again, it will be posted in a day or two. Or if you have friends that you think uh, this information would be useful for, you can guide them to this site and they can listen to the archived version of this webinar. You can follow Terry on Twitter at twitter.com backslash Terry Limeron. And we'd be honored if you find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Terry Talks Nutrition. Thank you so much for your attendance. And until we meet again, good health to you. Bye-bye.